So you've watched the mastery guide, which is still yet to come out, but it will be out. Check it out before you check this video out to learn how to play Cathay. It'll be out in a couple of weeks maybe, but today we are running through Cathay and formations to help you find your feet. Basically tier zero, all the way up to tier five, running through all their laws of magic, all the synergy you can get with their heroes, and how you should cope if you do or don't have the DLC. If you start as Miao Ying, which I highly recommend if you're a newer player, then this will require you to defend the Bastion Gates. And getting good at defending these is really strong because you will continually get bombarded by Norskins, have to defend them, and sometimes win more than one fight in a row. But when you know how, they're very easy. So here we are with our bonus, which is the siege battle. And this is quite important because you will fight several of these. Each of the gates has roughly the same setup, a very long, narrow style map, which of course has these towers at the front. So by placing your units at each of these, they will allow you to unload some arrows, at which point you should fall back the most moment they make contact with the walls because these units will be needed to hold the line because you will usually be outnumbered. So as you see we're only having three but we're going to hotkey them number zero so we can just quickly press that number and then rapidly send them back to the town center here. This is important because we have four tower locations off this single node so at any settlement battle find yourself a single choke point which has even just two towers that you can defend and you can choke point and use these to do excellent air of effect damage. Now, now, these four towers, we eventually want to get the tier four tower. This does big area of effect damage and armor piercing, which your basic garrison units typically won't be able to deliver. So this allows you to take on heavily armored troops, way more than the number that's in your garrison. So do a quick checkerboard of your range units, then use your melee units to bottleneck the entrances and then keep your others in reserve so they can run in to any of these areas that might be getting damaged. Keep your Iron Hell Gunners fanned out and able to shoot into the flanks of the enemy and your cavalry around the back. As the battle begins, your towers will unload some good armor piercing damage, so make sure you focus them on high value units, i.e. units with either shields or a lot of armor that your crossbows might struggle to get through. Keep an eye on your supplies when you hit that magic 2000, drop an enhanced tower. Just remember at your choke point, only ever invest in tier three or tier four towers. You can scatter wicker towers around your settlement after those are deployed, but getting that choke point built up for that area of effect is absolutely king. All three units that are sitting on the walls we have highlighted and ready to drag back the moment they make contact with the wall. We do not want them stuck fighting, we want them retreating back. However, all of this time is spent raining down additional tower damage. Now your brave Cathayan troops are trained not to leave a man behind, so if only a couple of them get caught up in melee, the rest of the guys will want to go back for them, so try to avoid them getting stuck. So preemptively, we are running them back off the towers all the way back to the town center. You can see the three lines and we want to keep on reminding them. Every so often, just give them another click in the middle. I find dragging a line to deploy them and give them a space to move in is a really great way to get them automatically running. And this also helps you shape the formation, i.e. the width of the column they'll run in. We want them to not be too wide, but not too skinny so they get left behind. This is a good shape. They'll be able to fit within the corridors of the settlement, but not conga lining so bad that little Jimmy gets eaten behind. As the enemy approaches the town center, you'll begin to build barricades which will help slow them down but more importantly your towers can start landing some of that excellent area of effect damage but against large single entities like this giant mammoth it will also do some serious damage just make sure when you run your melee troops back that they don't land on top of other troops so you're susceptible to their area of effect and also do not land on top of your range units and prevent them from shooting we have our iron hell gunners able to shoot freely and quickly downing that mammoth the key here is to pin a single unit in place so your towers can get really great line of sight, your arrows can shoot over the top, then cycle charge another unit into there pinning them in place, pulling the other unit back so they can rest. Do not blob all of your units up, this will not help you. You don't need to be overly focused on fatigue in this game, but believe me, having fresh units to charge into a melee will really, really help you. Once your four main towers are built, you can use barricades to slow the enemy and debuff them. Or what I like to do for a bit of fun is just build some small tier one, tier two towers, sprinkle around the settlement where they're not likely to capture soon. It's not a lot of damage, but it all adds up. And it means that they'll take some damage whilst trying to capture. You'll notice we're only trying to pin a single bottleneck with one unit at a time because we know that our towers aren't that great at shooting accurately all the time. One of those missiles could come and hit our units. We don't want three of our units blobbed up to taking friendly fire, one unit pins the enemy down, opens, exposes their flanks to our crossbows, to our gunfire, and then occasionally will charge another unit into the flank to try and break them. 
The campaign ability of the Wujing Compass will allow you to point it in four different directions. It will either give you a summon, or in this case of Bombard ability, we're going to drop it right now and essentially nuke three units that were pinned in place. Any bombardment ability, wait for the units to be pinned in one place and then dump them down, gaining excellent mileage and in this case, pretty much winning the entire freaking battle. Remember, you can select any tower and select its target. It might miss, so keep in mind targeting their Lord might hit more of your units than theirs, but at the same time, you chose those tier 4 towers, so it will deliver really good damage. But your target priority absolutely should be hoarding up their high armored elite infantry underneath these towers and then blasting them to pieces. And and that's how you win a siege with the garrison, losing basically nothing. And yes, this wasn't necessarily the hardest battle. We did take down a couple of mammoths, but we could fight this battle another five, six, seven times and still win it. And that's the point. You will get smashed by several tribes in a row with these northern gates. This strategy will allow you to always win and always have strong gates, and you'll be able to recover your losses each turn faster than they can throw new troops. You get rich looting their corpses, and in essence, your kingdom is never really at risk. Just a quick reminder guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing, it really helps out. Ask any question in the comments, I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. Cheers. So you survived your siege battles, but what happens? You're in the mid to late game and all of a sudden someone declares war on you and you need an army in a snap. What do you do? Well, late game, you'll likely have some decent buildings, but here's a great example. Just say here, Clan Angren declare war on us and we need to act very quickly and mount at least some defense better than none. We can use a similar tactic to what we did before, pitting down a couple of towers, but just say we need to hire ourselves a Lord in a pinch and I would always recommend it using the law of yin or yang but in this case the law of yang i think is more useful in low level lords and when you're in small confined areas of which sieges absolutely are you can gain more local recruitment slots by switching over to the edict if you have access to it additionally if your province is yang aligned you'll get another plus one local recruitment so if you're really in a pinch you can be a bit more creative and then switch yourself to yang alignment and enjoy that extra uh, recruited unit keep on going for every three r Watches go one peasant spear. Now moving on to what you probably came to see which is the formations on the battlefield. Now this is a crisis army i.e. one that you can hire any place anytime with the most basic of units that you should have on hand. We're going to start with my signature two hollow diamonds. You'll see this is quite a staple because I think it's easy to react to, adaptive and the units are far enough apart that they don't all get caught up if the enemy does advance and everyone that gets pinned leaves enough space for the other units around them to shoot into the flanks. Behind the two hollow diamonds, we're going to have a back line of three archers, but most importantly, we're going to place five melee units around the outside. Three on the front, two on the rear flanks, and then also some cavalry off to one side. Now if you have the artillery advantage, you'll be able to shoot at them and make them come to you. But sometimes you won't have that. You'll need to advance the army. You need to know how to advance the entire army in formation. Either control A to select everyone or just left drag to select the relevant units and then left click unit whilst holding alt. This will move the entire template of the formation up and down the field. If you need to rotate it, just hold control and you can pivot it left or right. The main body of your army should always be moved up with this. Only individual cavalry or mobile flying units it should be moved individually. This formation is quite similar to the next one, so I'll focus more on that there, but I just want to touch on the law of Yang, and this is a better law to use if you only have, say, level one. This law particularly shines if you can only hire a low level caster, particularly in a confined area. As you can see, Wall of Flame is very, very slow and doesn't deal any armor piercing. Dragon Fire can deal a nice little burst of damage. If you can hurt the enemy together, both of these are very great damage spells early on in the campaign. Jade Shield makes any unit shrug off 44% of all damage, so assisting the army is an alchemist, a very easy to obtain hero. They increase movement on the campaign map, so they're good to have around, but their Searing Doom spell is really, really strong. For the lore of Yang, the high level spells are very powerful, but they're quite expensive what they do, dealing big but pricey area of effect damage, and a buff that you will only really want to use in your Dragon Lord, but you can stack this with alchemy to deal some insane damage. The lore of Yang is specialized in close quarters combat, the passive boosts your nearby melee units. If you can hire even a level 2, 3, 4, 5 Lord, these spells are relatively cheap for what they do, and they can deal some really, really nice area of effect damage. Also, casting Jade Shield on that line holder will 
will keep them in place, allowing you to blast more enemies to pieces. Moving up to tier 2, which is the tier your Jade Warriors really start to shine, so why not use the Jade Dragon Yuan Bo? If you don't have the expansion, you won't be able to play as him, but you can still utilize all of these units, and only one of these units is expansion specific. Just replace it with some Jade Lancers if you don't have it. Every single Cathayan Lord can gain unyielding, which will boost your melee units and sure aim to increase the damage output of your touches and eventually when you replace them into crossbows. These units are your bread and butter and they can be globally recruited in one turn the moment you build your 10th barracks. Now if you don't have the expansion you have a bit less incentive to build the barracks and you might want to get a few more alchemists but if you do have the expansion every level 3 barracks will give you another gate master and this unit is freaking excellent for the simple reason your best units are your jade units in the low to mid game and this ability the jade standard will increase their melee defense and make them cheaper and yes this does stack so if you want you can put two two gate masters in each army and enjoy that buff don't go more than two you're better off gaining some magic in there but still you'll have a lot of alchemists so we're throwing one alchemist in this army as well for that extra campaign movement now very similar to the previous formation we will use our two hollow diamonds but this time at the very front we'll put our iron hell gunners a short range but very very powerful gunpowder unit since guns need line of sight being in the front position means they will get in range sooner and will not be obstructed allowing the archers behind them to fire over their head of course, the front line are three Jade Warriors, and on the rear right and rear left flanks, we will place two more Jade Warrior units. In these rear positions, you could always put a Halberd unit, making it more effective to take on any flanking cavalry. What's most important is your shields are on the front line. To screen for any arrows, your gunpowder is unimpeded with easy line of sight, and you can use your single entities, which is your characters and your large monsters, to pin an enemy in place and then shred them with gunpowder. Remember, if you need to reposition, hold Alt and left click to move up the formation you can hold control to tilt it left or right move yourself in a position where the terrain will cover one of your flanks whenever you have a static formation like this it always helps to have at least one mobile flying unit able to herd around and if they do have a ranged advantage over you you can fly overhead and destroy their artillery yuan bo can overcast the net of amantok which acts pretty similar to storm slowing the enemy down or in this case pinning them in place allowing your archers to get amazing range damage on them Whilst it's great to use the terrain to block an enemy from flanking, they will get around you. If they do, select one of your rear units and stretch them out to face the incoming unit. If they are stationary and facing an enemy, that counts as bracing and anti-large units will deny the charge. Now, sometimes they'll have units which do get through, particularly things like chariots which have a lot of mass. But what do you do? Don't panic. Don't cluster all of your units together because that means multiple units get roped into the same combat. Keep everyone apart and this here demonstrates why checkerboarding is so effective. For them to grapple with one unit, they have to get in range with several others. The quickest way to break any unit is to focus fire with missiles and if possible, charge into its rear. So the formula simply is, just engage with one unit, focus fire with your range units and then use your other free melee unit to charge into the rear. Whenever you spot archers with nothing to shoot at, make sure you pivot and focus multiple of them on a single target, using your flying advantage to either hunt down lords or harass enemy archers. Remember to keep an eye out for clusters of units to drop bombardment spells on. I'm so sorry I'll never find your name through all the comments, but there was a commenter who asked how do I deal with green skins as Grand Cathay because I'm getting overwhelmed. That makes a lot of sense because their muscly orcs are going to really pound you, they're numerous, and they will overwhelm your front lines. These armies are investments, not just soldiers. The most simple path to unstoppable Jade Army is to get Fletchling Mentors on the way to getting defensive formations plus 4 for all of your staple units melee defense. Get an extra 20% range damage and these top 3 skills in the second bracket will improve your damage output and range capabilities. Give your Lord a few red skills and you will have an unstoppable army of Jade Warriors. And on the field, you handle formation just like you did before, but here they have some artillery, so we'll need to use our ranged flying units. When you fight as a static army like this, you do not want to be an easy target for artillery. Try not to give your range units targets until they're in range so they don't run forward. You want them to keep that nice spacing because an army like this will have some people get through. If someone's in trouble, just cast J Shield on them, give them some extra defense. If someone does get through, hold them with one unit and then focus fire down their range units when they're in range because that's the priority that will deal the most damage to you. And there you have it, far from perfectly fought, but the army had good stats, good synergy and was able to take on two armies including Grimgore. Now moving up to tier three. More barracks at tier three means more gate masters, but going to your capital, your first stop should always be the Celestial Tower. This will give you 
access to astromancers and bolster your research rate and once you get it to tier 4 you gain another astromancer they are now excellent you can have two in your army have one on the bird dumping spells down from above and one at the back able to also boost the spell power of your army now after you've built that you want the alchemist tower not only increases local recruitment it'll give you an extra alchemist tier 5 increases global recruitment being able to hire an entire army of really great units anywhere we want is of course very nice now the law of yin is a bit of a dark horse law and i'll show you why the passive here decreases all enemy speed by 10%, as well as lowering their armor. Now that stacks with Storm of Shadows, so 45 plus 10 is a 55% reduction in speed with lower armor. That's why you overcast it and you will pin down several units. Don't depend on Ancestral Warriors, but they can come clutch if you're really desperate. Talent of Night does armor piercing, but it's a bit expensive for what it does. Now our next formation, we are dealing well into tier 3 and we are using the Crane Gunners. So a typical two hollow diamonds, but we're now fronting them with two Crane Gunners, ensuring we separate them just enough in case something does break through. And we're placing a single unit of Iron Hell Gunners with their short range right in the middle. So if anything does get through, this will blast them to pieces, but we don't want anything getting through. So let's place three Jade Warriors at the front with their shields and high armor to deflect from enemy arrows. However, we want lots of opportunity for our gun units, so having those full units of Jade Warriors spaced out is key, and we are going to use single entities, i.e. single units, to group large clumps of infantry together to allow them to get shredded by our Crane Gunners. But now, using the wonders of Yin Magic, Thumping along to the sound of a single war drum, you only need one. This will help spread the harmony and give an increase to reload speed, which is essentially their rate of fire, and increasing the melee attack of our front line. This is also benefited by our tier 3 Grand Cannons, a fantastic range unit, dealing fire damage as well as being quite accurate. Like all range units, benefits from the harmony bonus, so make sure you have a Yang unit somewhere nearby. So we have the artillery advantage as the enemy approaches, our artillery is peppering them, let's slow them down, overcast by double clicking on storm of shadows and we can see the enemy is now slowed down to over half speed with reduced armor and they are going to be absolutely shredded we're choosing to do it on some of their larger units now but if they do have a single key lord or a couple of key heroes this can also be used to slow them down a slow unit is way easier for your ranged units to hit this can be an absolute death sentence if they're in the open without any other debuffs you can see just how deadly your crane gunners are and gunpowder in general is to single entities. The most important thing about your gunpowder units is to provide them with opportunity. Yes, you should usually overcast Storm of Shadows, but don't forget if you see a single unit that is of value, just pin it down with a single cast. There's no point wasting wins. But the last trick I'll show you is how do you deal with a single Lord that's very tanky, that could really wreck you in melee. Well, same deal, slow them down and target the gunpowder. You can make this process even quicker by using your Alchemist Metallurgy abilities to enhance the gunpowder or even use the Law of Metal, casting Plague of Rust to ruin their armor. Just look how effective a single volley is when they're stripped of their armor, and yes, we overcast it here, and oh, I don't think I need to say anything else. Having an Alchemist on a Moonbird and your Dragon Shuganen on a Flying Longmar gives you two nimble flying casters that can harass enemy range units and, of course, rain death from above. And of course, good old Yaming, the Iron Dragon, mostly specialized towards a more melee, close range type of fighting. You can gain a lot of benefit in a late game army because uh, Celestial Dragon Guard are one of the best defensive infantry in the game. They have a shield as well as anti-large, but you don't want these to be your pure damage dealer. Don't forget the Celestial Crossbows are also incredible and they will, no matter what you do, these will deal more damage than anything else because they're so good at what they do. Using the great longer riders can be used as cavalry, but the idea you'll see is we're going to envelop the enemy and pounce at once. Since these videos are either intended to inform or inspire new ideas with your playstyle, I try to keep a relatively consistent theme or motif with the armies whilst throwing in other bits of flavor, also showing in the battles themselves different things that can happen. Now, so far we've gone through a very safe defensive style with a good ranged core, but now we're going to move to a bit of a hybrid in case this is how you want to play your playstyle and especially if you want to dial into Xia Ming. I've now shown a scenario that will no doubt happen at some point. They have artillery and you don't and you're the one with a 
close to mid-range army. How do we deal with it? You don't need to spam in this game, and honestly, the right amount of moderation, even if it's only just a couple units here and there, can really help you get some flexibility and more enjoyable dynamic out of your battles. Rather than going full spam melee units, we're going to have a typical formation here, so just the two hollow diamonds of archers, that's all we need for our range support, but we're going to defend the warrior on all four corners with our celestial dragon guard with halberds. And yes, we'll move these rear ones forward, but after we know that we're safe and we won't get flanked. In the center of the formation, it sits the war drum, as well as a second astromancer sitting atop a Wujing war compass, bolstering the army's magic damage, as well as attaining a couple of extra heaven spells. Now, the enemy have the artillery advantage, so you'd think we need to rush them down. And essentially we do, we need to close the gap, but that does not mean we let our proud Cathayan formation fall to crap. Of course, control A to select all your units, then hold Alt to shunt the entire formation up the map, but beware, of course your flying units will get up there first. You need to make sure they don't just fly ahead and get killed, so when you move the army up, be sure to immediately select your fast mobile flying units. Here we have some flying longbow riders, and we can give them individual commands. If you hold Shift, you can draw all sorts of funny shapes, which will either defer them or even make them more evasive. Accompanying them, of course, is the most important unit in this army, aside from our Lord, which is the Astromancer on the Moonbird, able to also harass the enemy whilst dumping major magical damage on them. We're distracting the heavy artillery fire, allowing our army time to march up. Just make sure you don't lose your formation. Keeping in formation is absolutely key. The best way to achieve this is to march not quite in range of the enemy arrows, just giving those straggling units a little bit more time so you can all move up. You might take a bit more fire, but you will be a united powerful force when you charge. Yes, we take a hit right here, but it's honestly worth staying in formation. Remember you get that yin yang bonus by having units close by, but this is a good habit to have anyway. We now have our flying longbow riders sitting in the wings. If they start getting shot or get stuck in a fight they can't win, just pull them back. But you ideally want them up here in the corners so they can all pounce at once. The biggest threat to your melee units in terms of both damage and morale is getting shot by their ranged units. So that's why we use our longbow riders to flank around the enemy and to take them out. As long as you tie them up in melee, they can't shoot back at you and this is hugely important. Notice we still follow the same fundamentals. We're shooting overhead with our crossbows, focusing the enemy down and pinpointing the terracotta sentinels, armor piercing damage to where it's most needed. Keep in mind they are a large unit so they will attract a lot of missile fire so don't consider them immortal. If anything take advantage of the fact they'll get crowded around and use area of effect damage to both free them up and ruin the enemy. It's fairly common for the MVP in most armies to be your nimble flying caster, especially when they're on a mount that's both powerful and fast, which the Moonbird really ticks both those boxes, allowing your caster to not be on a big slow mount so it attracts missile fire, but instead able to avoid it, dumping down spells, able to get around quickly, and if it needs to tangle, it can do a really beasty charge. Just remember after your Dragon Lord has cast their support spells to transform and join them in that same job. And of course the Storm Dragon, everyone's favorite, Meow Ying. Last but certainly not least, utilizing Crane Gunners and three Sky Junks to really smash the enemy to pieces with an enjoyable range of 565 from above. Also, if you get a chance to beat the Chaos Dwarf Lord just north of you, Zartan the Black, you'll gain another 15% to your artillery units. Make sure you defeat him once with Meow Ying to get that ability. But of course, Crane Gunners, dealing excellent damage, splitting the enemy shields. You only need two, you don't need to go over Board. These will shred the enemy. Satan the Watcher also has some really nice buffs, increasing the range of Sky Junks, the range, as well as the damage and effectiveness of the Cathayan bow units. So he works really well in any army, but of course, very, very nice with Miao Ying. Don't forget, there's one more buff along this line. He's just the gift that keeps on giving. Satan's only with the expansion, but if you have it, Enjoy it. You'll notice in most of my formation videos, I don't go too overboard with magic because I want the formation to do the heavy lifting, not our casters. You should always have a very busy flying mount caster, so being a tier 5 army, we're going to start with our two hollow diamonds. We want crane gunners up front, getting those perfect shots, downing a few single entities or characters on their approach. This is a yin centered army, so we want to overcast that storm of shadows to slow the enemy. So this is all about doing as much damage as we can before they get close. The perimeter of the formation is surrounded by dragon guard and you know why they're there. However, we do have a spare dragon guard thanks to some good deployment. We have our left flank covered, but we're still going to keep that dragon guard in reserve so if anyone does get through it can charge in and save the day of course the mighty skyjunks sitting down the back raining down hell let's do it 
Since Skyjunks have line of sight from the air, they can usually shoot around terrain even when it's really lumpy like this, giving you an excellent head start. Many maps have points where the enemy will be forced to bunch up and you can really capitalise on this with some crafty shots from the Skyjunk. If you think you could aim better yourself, you can hold Alt and click to manually fire, but just remember to return to regular. Satang the Watcher is an excellent warrior and his bow will do amazing damage from afar. Miao Ying is charging up ahead, ready to get a decisive cast of Storm of Shadows on a group of enemy units, leaving them pinned and frozen for dead for the enemy ranged units. Chaos Dwarfs heavily armoured and fierce, but being punished for their low foot speed, taking a lot of punishment. And this army can handle anything, a Celestial Dragon Guard have shields, can block as well as deal anti-large damage up close. The Crane Gunners will snipe down the single entities, and we aren't even baiting the enemy with our Astromancer. Crane Gunners have successfully sniped down their Lord, and that Bull Centaur has no chance. Once there's no more good casts for Storm of Shadows, transform into Dragon Mode and devastate them. Satan the Watcher has a giant bow and will deal awesome damage both at range and up close. And don't forget, Mia Ying has Earth Blood as well as Regrowth to heal any of your characters. And those are all the formations and common combinations I would recommend for your Cathay campaign and I hope this has been useful. If you're trying to find your feet, I really can't recommend enough. It is a one hour video, but my Miao Ying first campaign guide will really help you understand the mechanics so you control your game and it does not play you instead. I have tier list walkthroughs and mastery guides to several races. A ton of work goes into them. I hope you enjoy them. Please consider liking, subbing. This is Alvin. Cheers.